Let's talk about common washes. Watercolor is basically a series of washes. That's what we call them in this business. Here I have drawn out some rectangles. Each one will be a slightly different wash technique. Now I'm going to angle my board downwards using the roll of masking tape. Multi-purpose materials. If you have it flat, the wash tends to sit on the paper, which isn't ideal because you can't get a good bead going. More on that later. So the first technique is the wet and dry wash. In this case, the paper is 100% dry. I am using wet paint, obviously, to apply that to the first rectangle. Notice, because my board is tilted, how the water starts to bead towards the bottom of that wash. And with each brush stroke, I will just join to that bead or the bottom of the wash and guide that in the direction that I want it to go, which is downhill. So if you do this correctly, you should end up with a nice, even, flat wash. So that is wash number one, again, working on dry paper. Wet and wet wash is basically where you're dealing with a wet surface. In this case, I'm just using water to pre-wet the rectangle. In this example, I will use my cobalt turquoise and a very thin mixture here, which we will talk about later, and then use the same technique. So starting at the top and working downward. With each new loaded brush full of paint, I will just simply go to the bottom of that bead and then work downwards. Again, if you do it correctly, you should end up with a nice flat wash. So that is working wet into wet, very similar to wet and dry, but with a wet surface, the paint tends to disperse quicker than working on a dry surface. Now again, these are flat washes, so there is no variation of color or gradation going on. So basically one color and that's it. Now let's talk about a variegated wash. So a variegated wash means you're using two or more colors. I will begin with a dry surface. So I haven't pre-wet this particular rectangle. And using alizarin crimson, I will start forming my bead and working side to side. Now I'm going to mix a little bit of the turquoise into that. Again, starting with the bottom, notice how I'm joining the bottom of that wash with each new loaded brush. I can blend that back and forth. It's okay to work into wet paint like that. Again, we will talk about these techniques much more as we move forward. And I will end with a little more alizarin crimson. So as you can see, the technique was the same. The only difference was I use more than one hue. Now let's talk about a gradated wash. This is when you have multiple values in a particular wash. In this example, I will have a darker value towards the top of the wash, and then it will get lighter as it goes towards the bottom. You can use multiple colors on this, but to keep it simple, I'm going to use only one. And I will opt to use a little bit of a violet color, which is ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson starting at the top, and again, this is a dry rectangle, so I'm not working into a wet surface, this is a dry surface. But this can be done on a wet surface as well. Now, as I get to the bottom of the rectangle, I'm going to add more water to my base mixture, and that's going to give me a lighter value. So even with that subtle change, you can start to see how this wash appears a little bit differently than the, say the flat wash. Now I want to increase the value towards the top. So I'm going to mix up a little more violet. This time there's a less water and more pigment into that particular mixture. So I will start at the top and then lightly blend that towards the bottom. As I get to the middle, I can add a little more water to my brush and then blend that out as evenly as I can. So that is a gradated wash. I'm having it taped to the board as I do here, allows me to tilt it in whatever direction
that I want the wash to move in. So here we are, we can look at all of these common washes. I do recommend that you grab a sheet of paper, a few hues, and you create a similar wash study. That way, as you move forward through this course, these things become a little more familiar to you. How you handle your washes will have a huge impact on your watercolor paintings. Common mixtures. There are three you need to know about. Let's talk about how they work and how they will impact your artwork. The three labels I give them are tea, milk, and honey. Things we all are familiar with and each one is slightly different. So let's begin with the very first one, which is tea. So tea is very watery. So when I'm mixing a tea mixture, I want to use more water and less pigment. In this case, I have a lot of water and a little bit of cad red light. So that is very, very faint. You can barely see that hue on the paper. Now let's talk about milk. So milk is a little bit thicker. And in this case, I'm using more pigment and a little bit less water. And that brings us to honey. Honey is very thick and very sticky. So a little bit of water and a lot of paint. And that's going to give us the three base mixtures you need to know about. Each one has its own purpose and a really good painting has all three. So again, as a reminder, tea has more water and less pigment. It makes it ideal for a sky or an area where you don't want a lot of color or a very rich value. We will talk about that more later on. Milk has less water and more pigment, as I mentioned earlier. More color, a little more saturation going on, and very useful for building up a painting. So when we get to honey, it's extremely saturated and it tends to show the texture of the paper a little bit. So you can see the little white specks peeking through some of that paint. So with a tea mixture, it's very transparent. So you can typically see through that layer. With a milk mixture, it's going to be semi-transparent and obviously a little more colorful. So you lose a little transparency, but you gain a little color out of it. With the honey mixture, you're dealing with a very opaque layer of paint. Typically, you're going to use all three of these mixtures in every painting. So a painting is built in layers. One layer stacks on top of another one. It's important to get the order correct. Typically, you will start with a T layer. And as you know, these are very watered down and ideal for toning the paper or adding a very light value to a sky or something of that nature. So usually you're going to stack thin to thicker layers. So if you start with a really thin tea mixture, the next layer will be slightly thicker and you will get that by adding a little more pigment and using a little less water. Now this would be a good place to use a hair dryer. So if you put down a tea mixture, use your hair dryer, speed it up, and then you're ready for the second layer. And as you know, this would be slightly thicker paint. So I want to avoid a really watered down tea mixture. If I start stacking too many of those on top of each other, the painting will start to read weak. We will discuss that a little later in this course. So as you can see, my violet is a milk sort of mixture. So I can put that down and it reads really well over top of that first layer of tea. So I will move that over to the right and then I'm going to use a little bit of water in my brush and blend that into the left hand side of that milk mixture. By adding that water to that mixture is basically stacking two tea layers on top of each other, just for comparison. Now I will use a hair dryer to speed up the drying. For the third layer, I'm going to mix up something close to honey. Now it doesn't have to be honey. As long as it's slightly thicker, it usually works pretty good. So in this case, I'll just use a nice dark green and layer that over top 
of the section on the right. And here you can see how all of these layers read well. And this is basically an overview or an exercise in how you want to stack your layers. So again, slightly thicker as you go tends to work better in most cases. So let me show you a bad example here. Um, I'm going to put down a tea mixture of cobalt turquoise. Again, you can see it's about the same as I used in the beginning with the CAD red light. Again, using a hair dryer to speed up the drying time. Now, instead of going slightly thicker, I'm going to use a very watery mix of CAD red light. It'll go on pretty good. It doesn't read bad, but no, as watercolor dries, it tends to dry a little bit lighter. Just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to add some swatches here. So the first swatch is the blue, which is basically the tea mixture I used in the, be the beginning. I let that dry, and then I added a swatch of the CAD red light, which I put over top of that dry blue. So as you can see, it's not too bad. So two mixtures like this can work okay. But as I add this third layer, which is a violet, um, it's going to start to look washed out. Subtle contrast may work well in some cases, like a background, but you wouldn't want to build your entire painting around this. So ideally, you would want the paint to have more variety. So having some tea mixtures is fine, but if you start stacking too many of those on top of each other, it will just look washed out. So just be a little bit careful as we start getting into some of the projects later on that you're not using too many thin mixtures. And just for comparison, I'm going to do that same little study, but this time build it up using thicker paint as I go. Again, it's good to have that comparison. So trying to match the hues, I started with my weak cobalt turquoise and now I'm going to add a little bit slightly thicker layer of red. Again there's my swatch so we can kind of compare that to the other swatches as well. There goes my red and already you can see that particular wash has a little more uh, body to it so it's a little bit easier to read. Obviously I'm using my hair dryer here just to speed up the drying time just so I can stack these layers more quickly for you. So once this is dry, I'm going to add my violet. And this is a little bit thicker violet. So when you start looking at my swatches, um, you can see the difference. So stacking two layers is okay. I think it'll work you know, fine for most cases, but avoid, again, building your painting around a bunch of thin mixtures. Once you get into the three, four T mixtures in a painting, uh, then, it, then it tends to just kind of fall apart a little bit. So there's not enough variety and value there to make it interesting. So thin to thick is kind of the rule of thumb we want to use. Now for your project, you want to create a similar study. Uh, explore a little bit of the tea, milk, and honey ideas. Create some small swatches and just stack them so that you start to build up that connection with the different mixtures and how they read on the paper. Working light to dark. Another good idea to consider and put to use when watercolor painting. In this lesson, I will give you several examples of what I mean by working light to dark. I will begin by putting down a tea mixture of cad yellow lemon. Again, that's going to be very light in value for two reasons. First of all, cadmium yellow is a light value. And then also a tea mixture is very weak, as you already know. So you're dealing with a color that's inherently light and then a tea mixture, which will dilute the color even more. Now, this is a little bit different from what we just discussed in tea, milk and honey. And that's because we're going to focus more on a color's value, which as we move into this lesson, it will start to make a little more sense. To compare the cadmium yellow 
to something else, we're going to mix up another tea mixture of burnt sienna. So I'm using about the same amount of water and pigment as I did in the cad yellow. And lastly, I'm going to put a swatch down, again, a tea mixture of alizarin crimson. And now I will take a hair dryer to it to speed up that drying time. And the main thing we want to observe here is that the cadmium yellow lemon is a very light value. So even though I use the same water to pigment ratio on all three hues, the cad yellow is just simply a lighter value in color. So let's talk about value for a second. To do that, I'm going to use my neutral tint. Now I'm going to create a swatch or a value scale on the left hand side of the paper. And it's going to work from light to dark. Obviously the lighter value is towards the top and then the darker value is towards the bottom. So that cad yellow lemon value is towards the top of that scale. So pretty much one of the lighter values you can probably mix with a color. The burnt sienna is just below that. And I would say the alizarin crimson is in between the two. So the cad yellow would be the lightest, then the alizarin crimson, and then the burnt sienna would probably be the darkest. So again, just because you mix a tea mixture doesn't necessarily mean that you have a light value. As I add a little bit of burnt sienna over the yellow, you will see it's very effective. And that's because the yellow was so pale. So if I did another layer over the burnt sienna, which is alizarin crimson, and about the same water to pigment ratio, it's not as effective because that burnt sienna was simply a little bit too dark. So I'm letting you know this stuff because it's important to understand that each color has its own personality and color characteristics. Um, oftentimes we will get in the habit of mixing the same amount of water with a little bit of pigment and we think we have a tea mixture and because it's a tea mixture, we have a light value. But if you're using a color, that simply is darker in nature out of the two, like burnt sienna or even alizarin crimson, then we have to water that down even more. Where other colors like cad yellow light is light anyway, so a little bit of water will go a long way in making that a very pale wash. So again, you have to remember a watercolor painting is a series of washes that are stacked on top of each other. And in the end, we want to have a painting that works well. And part of that is just understanding the natural value of a color. And you want to use lighter values in the beginning so you can stack darker values and thicker paint on top of them. When we look at cad yellow lemon, that may not be an ideal color to use in late stages of a painting because it's so light in value that it's not going to sit well over thicker and darker values. Over time, you will start to develop a better connection to your colors and how much water it may need to get it to a certain value. So for your project, I would recommend you do a similar study. Just use the colors you have on your palette, do some swatches, and try to mix up some really light values that you would use for an initial wash and take notes and observe how each color is slightly different than the next. The ultimate goal is to have more control over a color's value and in order to adjust the value you may have to decrease or increase the amount of water you mix into the pigment. Now let's have some fun exploring brushes and brush strokes. Each brush is very different but there are some similarities that you need to know. So here's my big old mop brush. I've got my pointed round, my small pointed round, and then my sword brush. Let's begin with the large mop brush. Obviously, this is suited for large areas. It has a huge belly on it, and it can hold a lot of water and pigment. So a loaded brush means it's holding the maximum amount of water and pigment. 
So whenever you have a brush like this and you fully load it, it can really cover a lot of area. Now I can use either the tip and or the belly, the side of the brush. So there I'm using the side of the brush. I can hold it more upright and then use the tip to create these more calligraphic sort of strokes. Might be nice for trees, adding texture to a building, some details, different things like that. Let's explore the same thing with the number 10 round, which is suited for small washes and details. So I will load it up. So again, loaded means I have the maximum amount of water and pigment in the bristles, and then apply that to the paper. Now notice again, I can use the belly or the side of the brush, which will give me a broader stroke, which obviously will color, cover more area. And the tip of the brush will create finer details and thinner lines. I can hold the brush more upright, which I know I'm covering up my strokes, but this will create uh, these nice linear strokes. I can do that sideways, I can do that vertically, whatever works. So again, using the side of the brush to create a, a different type of stroke works good. And then using the point or the tip of that brush to create details. Obviously a brush like this is suited for more detail work and smaller washes. So that's going to work better than let's say using a mop brush for details, which wouldn't really be ideal. Now let's look at the number four pointed round. I'm dealing with a much smaller belly, so it's very thin. So ideally, we would want to use it for more details. So I can load a brush up like this and create a series of lines. It's good for adding accent colors and things like that. Note with all of these brushes, I'm not just using one part of the bristle. I'm actually using the tip, I'm using the side, and getting a variety of brush strokes. So each brush is very versatile. You just have to get out of the habit, if you're in one, of using it the same way. So get familiar with applying paint with different parts of the bristles. Here you can see I'm adding some small areas of wash and then using the tip of that brush to get some details. With a brush like this, it's fun to add little dots. So if you're trying to add you no know, leaves or some sort of texturing going on, this would be the ideal brush to use. So again, uh, number four pointed round is a lovely brush to have at your fingertips. And it can certainly do uh, much smaller strokes in detail than let's say a number four pointed around. But then again, we wouldn't want to use it uh, to put down a large area of wash either. Here I'm painting a couple of telephone poles here and I'll use the tip of that um, brush to add some wires and things like that. So just a little demo here to uh, just show you the versatility of these brushes, kind of what they're suited for. And then you can kind of explore these things on your own. That brings us to the wild card, the three quarter inch sword. Um, this is a fun brush to explore. We got the really fine tip, which is suited for uh, thin calligraphic lines and strokes. Um, you're going to find that's pretty handy uh, in most of your painting subjects. We've got the side of the brush, which can create these really uh, unpredictable, uncontrollable, almost uh, sort of strokes and results. Again, ideal for a lot of things. So if you're doing uh, trees and or just trying to add some texture to the ground and you don't want it to be too uniformed or predictable, uh, this is a great brush to work with. Uh, I started uh, using the sword a lot the last three years and I just, I find it just a very, very handy tool to have around and I use it in every single painting. So if you like to do a thinner line work, um, if you're doing subjects that require things like that, uh, then it's great. If you like to do uh, strokes or if you need strokes that are somewhat irregular, uh, they're good for that too. So here you can see I'm showing you the tip of the brush. Uh, then 
Um, I can add all these nice little detail strokes. And then of course, you know, I, I use the broad side of it as well to put down larger areas of pigment. Knowing the versatility of your brushes is key. Um, a painting is basically a series of brush strokes. Um, so knowing that you have a lot of ways you can use a brush is important. Um, that way it gives you um, and your painting uh, more interest. So when you're using a variety of strokes, um, it looks more interesting than just using the same sort of stroke uh, with different brushes. So again, we've got the belly of the brush. Uh, we've got the tip of the brush. Be sure to experiment uh, using all sides of it because this is where you'll really start to enjoy and embrace uh, applying paint and getting some fun, spontaneous results. All right, so for your project, I want you to create a similar chart as I did here and enjoy getting to know each brush and how versatile uh, it can be. So that way when you get to painting, you have more familiarity with strokes and the range of strokes you can make. It's all about the water. Believe me, the more you understand how water affects watercolor, your brushes, the better off you are. So remember these exercises, tea, milk, honey, uh, using water to dilute the paint. Um, we're going to do something similar, but we're going to do it in a few different ways. I will do a few swatches. I will do some alizarin crimson and then put it down on dry paper. Now, dry paper is very thirsty, so it's going to absorb that water and pigment off of the brush. It's going to literally pull it out of the bristles. Again, that's dry paper. Now I'm going to take a loaded brush that's loaded with water and pre-wet an area on the paper. Now I'm not going to over wet it. I'm just going to dampen it a little bit. So it's wet, which means there's already water there. And I'm going to put the same wash into that paper. Now, the observation is slightly wet paper isn't as thirsty as the dry paper. It's still absorbent. It's still going to take the paint, but it doesn't extract it as quickly because it's not as thirsty, all right? Because it's already wet. So two scenarios there of painting on dry paper and wet paper. Now, for both of those examples, my brush was wet or damp, so it wasn't overly wet. And we talked about that earlier when we said, hey, wet your brush, but tap it out a little bit. You don't want all that water on the paper or palette. Now, with this brush, I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to wet it, but it's going to be a little bit sloppy. So I didn't really take any of the excess water out of it. Now, I may have some issues on the palette where things are puddling up, but as far as the paper is concerned, when I apply it to the dry paper, it's going to still slurp it right up. So that's because the paper is very, very thirsty. It wants that moisture and it's going to extract it. Now, if I use the same very, very wet brush into an area that's already pre-wet, which is what I'm going to do now, Notice how it doesn't really slurp that paint up as much. It tends to kind of puddle up a little bit. And what we're slowly observing and learning here is that how wet a surface or a brush is will greatly impact which way the paint or water is moving. So in this case, where I had a very, very wet brush and very wet paper, the paper almost started to reject the paint. Almost like there's a battle going on over which one wants to refuse the paint more so. So a fully loaded and wet brush wants to discharge, get rid of the water and pigment. But if you have a wet surface, it's not going to accept it. We'll do the same idea, but this time with slightly wet paper. And just to be clear, the paper isn't as wet as the condition that I just did. But I'm still going to use a really loaded brush but the paper accepted the paint better and that's because the paper was drier than the fully saturated brush 
So one of them was ready to accept the paint more so than the other. Again, this is all about understanding how water works. Basically, when the paper is drier, then the brush is going to pull water and pigment from it. Simple as that. So just to compare that to this scenario, I will start with a very wet swatch. So again, completely saturated and kind of puddling up on the surface here. And then I will add some very, very wet paint to it. And you will see the paint just tends to puddle up as it did before. So we did a very similar swatch. So when both of them are equally wet or overly wet, makes a really bad environment or condition to paint in. So let's watch as I remove the moisture from my brush, it will extract paint from the paper. So yes, water does move uphill in, in the right environment. So that just shows you that if the brush is thirsty, if it's drier than the paper, then it's going to actually pull pigment from it. Just like if the paper is drier than the brush, then it's going to pull pigment from the brush. And remember that brushes need to be slightly damp to work well. Dry paper can accept paint at any point, but a dry brush, this doesn't release the paint very well. So make sure you have a damp brush, but always pay attention to the conditions. Pay attention to how wet your surfaces and how wet your brush is. Are you trying to extract paint or are you trying to put paint down? If things are too wet, you may have to let it dry a little bit to add more pigment. To explore these ideas, um, I recommend creating a similar study. Kind of go back and forth with really wet paper, really wet brushes, and just note how the pigment reacts in certain conditions. Try a really wet paper and a very dry brush to understand how it extracts paint in certain conditions, okay? Hope you enjoyed the lesson. I'll see you in the next one. In this lesson, we will be working with wet conditions and learning a lot about timing. When to add paint and when not to add paint to a wet wash. To do that, I will begin with a flat wash. I will use my good old mop and some alizarin crimson for this exercise. I'm not going to overly wet the paper. I would say this is like a tea mixture applied to the surface. So I'm not trying to push it in any direction, whether it be too dry or too dark. Just your good old average wash. Now I sectioned off the area on the left hand side. That is very wet because I just applied the wash. And I'm going to immediately add paint, a tea mixture note, to that wash. So this blue is a very thin mixture into the wet alizarin crimson. Now, when I work into that wet wash and I do it quickly, it's fine. You just have to know that because I'm working in a wet environment, it's going to disperse quickly. So it's going to really dissolve that tea mixture to a point where it'll, there'll be a subtle change, but it won't be too much. Now I'm going to mix up a milk mixture and then add that again to the wet wash. And note how the milk mixture doesn't dissolve as much. So the paint, the wet paper, I should say, has a more difficult time kind of eating into the thicker paint. And now the last swatch there was honey. So I added a very thick mixture into that wet paint and it barely dissolved it. Now, when we look closely at it, it's going to have soft edges, but it didn't really uh, dissolve it as much as of course the tea mixture and it didn't dissolve as much as the milk mixture. So the thicker the paint is, um, will determine how much dissolving or dispersing you get. So a thin mixture again is going to dissolve and disperse a lot and then the thicker paint not so much. Now as I've done this demo 
the middle area has dried quite a bit. So it's probably about 50% dry. So I'm going to repeat the same three mixtures. Okay, again, it's slightly drier. Timing is everything. So if I mix up a tea mixture and put into this uh, area now, what's going to happen is it's going to start to cauliflower. So I waited too long to add the tea mixture to the slightly drier paint. So when you're doing a thin layer like this, and then you add a thin layer to it that's mostly water, um, if you're too late, it's going to start to balloon and cauliflower. So you'll get these kind of funny looking watermarks in your washes. Now I will add the milk mixture. So slightly thicker paint going into the surface here is still semi-dry. And notice it works fine, okay? And that's because it has less water. So the tea mixture kind of started to cauliflower, and that's because the water is moving the paint now, where the thicker paint didn't really have that same impact. Now, if I add honey to that, that works fine as well. Again, it's going to have soft edges, but the edges are going to be harder than the first one. And that's because the paper is a little bit drier. For the last swatch, know that the paper is dry. I mean, that is probably 95% dry. And it's going to respond differently than the semi-dry or very wet paper in the previous swatches. So starting with my thin tea mixture, I will add that to the bottom. And notice no cauliflowering going on. So again, timing is important. So with paint that's almost dry, you can add a tea mixture over it. And it's just going to sit on top. And notice the edge quality too. The edges are very hard as opposed to the very wet conditions. The milk mixture is fine, but because the paper is pretty much dry at this point, I'm going to have very hard edges. And when we look and compare those to the previous examples, you will kind of see how that edge quality is impacted by the wetness of the paper and the wash. Now, honey, as you know, is going to be very stiff and it's going to have very hard edges. And at this point, it will probably show some of the texture of the paper. So again, timing is important. When you're dealing with a wet wash and you want to work into it, you have to know where you're at on this scale. When the wash is wet, you can certainly work into it just fine. Whether it be tea, milk, or honey, it's not gonna have a huge impact or negative impact on the results. This is probably one of the more challenging aspects for beginners is getting their timing right. So working wet into wet with no delay shouldn't be a problem at all. So I just showed you that again real quick in that little demo. So in the next example, I put my swatch down and I'm going to semi dry it. So we're going to get it to a point where it's let's say 50 to 60% dry. And because it's a very thin wash, you have to know when it's at this stage, if you go back into it with another tea mixture, it's very risky. If you go back into it at this stage, you would want to use slightly thicker paint so that you don't risk cauliflowering, getting those watermarks that are oftentimes undesirable. Again, thicker paint, you have no problem going back into it. All right. And also know that as you work into wet paint, the drier the wash is, the harder the edges are for the paint that you're applying. So that's a really good lesson on understanding how to work into wet washes. Something you're going to do a lot as you move forward with watercolor painting. So have a look at my results here. And then for your project, create a similar wash study. Experiment with different conditions, 
try to create cauliflowers so that you understand why it's happening and then tweak your timing and tweak your mixtures so that you understand how to avoid them. So good luck, have fun, and I'll see you in the next one. Let's talk about some odds and ends. Various techniques that you're going to want to use and at least know about as we move forward. I will go ahead and put a swatch down. Now you've kind of seen this before, but I want to make sure you understand the proper technique on how to use it. So again, a wet wash. And I want to lift or remove some of that wet paint. A good way to do that is simply to use a brush. You could use a paper towel or a napkin, but in this case, I have a damp brush. It's not saturated, it's only damp. So I wet it, I tapped it out, and because it's drier than the surface of the paper, it's going to extract that paint. So an easy way to lift what you will wanna do, and then let me show you the bad technique. So this is where I have an overly wet brush. As you can see, the water is dripping off. And I go into that wet paint. That's going to create the cauliflowering. So the water is going to eat into that paint and you will be left with watermarks. So try to avoid lifting with a brush or any sort of material that is too wet. I'm sure by now you know how important understanding water is to the success of your painting and all of these techniques. Huge. Now let's look at softening edges. Occasionally you will apply a stroke or two and the edge quality is just a little stiff. And in this case, I'm just putting down a little bit of red and just some other random color here. So the paint is still wet, but notice the both edges are extremely hard. Now my desire is to soften those edges. I have a damp brush, but it's not excessively wet. Again, as you probably already know, this is the ideal situation for removing or softening edges. So that little bit of moisture in my brush is going to soften the edge and just get that paint to loosen up a little bit. Now with a, an excessively wet brush, ah, I've got a bad situation on my hands because all that water is going to discharge into the paper. And that's because the paper is drier than the actual brush, which was really wet and you know which way the water is going to run in that environment. The last one is scraping or scratching into paint. You can do this with wet paint. You can also do it with dry paint if you have the right material. So basically in a situation like this, maybe you want to create some texture or maybe you just want some sort of detail in your painting. So I will put down an area of pigment here. Uh, again, just a random color. It's not overly wet, but notice that if you scratch into it too soon, while the paint is really wet, it may backfill into that groove. So when you scratch into the paint, what you're doing is you're basically creating a little groove in the paper. And obviously wet paint will want to go back into that groove. I'm going to speed up the drying just a little bit here and get this paint where it's semi-dry. And this is a really good condition to scrape. Now I can use my fingernail and scratch some marks into the paint and it's less likely to backfill. Another thing you can try is an X-Acto knife um, and this will give you some really fine lines. Now that paint on the right hand side is very dry, but notice how it lifts and scratches that paper and adds a little texture. So that's lifting, softening edges, and scraping or scratching into paint. Three odds and ends you will probably use in your watercolor painting. So create a similar study using these techniques. That way, when it comes time to kneading them, you know exactly how to do it.